appreciate it. Uh, Ariel Cohen, welcome. Thank you for being hey. part of this year. Welcome, Nick. Thanks for having me back and fantastic first day. Wow. I mean, that was, that was fun. It felt weird not having you as a part of it for a change. Strange. But it's usually a Thursday, right? So I'm still on on a <laughs> Thursday, right? There you go. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, if you don't know, Ariel Cohen is usually the one that follows the opening presentation. Um, but because of the time change a little bit this year, he wanted something early in the day. Noon, I wanted to give you the first one. And I'm excited about this one. This is volatility charts. And stuff we talked about with PLV yesterday was being able to assess volatility better uh, moving forward. And I'm excited for this one. Ariel, thank you so much. And also, congratulations for nomination. I think you were mentioning uh, four-time uh, Baseball Writer of the Year nomination. So uh, congratulations. Uh, three time, but... Uh, three time. Uh, yeah. Okay. Hey, but uh, this is... Uh, it- I, I'm stoked about that. And uh, by the way, you're nominated for Writer of the Year as well this I year. I know, Pretty but cool, it's huh? like, it, it it wouldn't feel real if you weren't nominated to. Same with, like, you know, Ryan Bloomfield and Michael Simeon. I mean, it's just, yeah, all right. I, <laughs> it, it's an incredible honor. And uh, yeah, congratulations again. But I'm going to let you go. Um, I'm excited for this panel. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. And hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to PitchCon Day 2. We've got a fantastic Pre- uh, presentation here for you about the ATC projections, volatility metrics, a lot of stuff in store for you. We'll talk about process risk, parameter risk, quantifying risk, and so on and so forth. A little bit about me, uh, a timeline here. Uh, I started playing fantasy baseball back in 2001. I was a professor for a little while, became an actuary, um, and started publishing projections at 2017 on fan graphs, started writing a little bit later and podcasting as well, and yeah, Nick mentioned a uh, uh, couple of uh, nominations there and uh, some writing awards, uh, projections, accuracy awards. So ATC projections uh, have been dubbed as good. Uh, that's fantasy pros word, not mine. Uh, and uh, the expert leagues, I've been uh, participating in a couple of them. So there you go. Uh, and of course, you can follow my work. I have the ATC projections. I'm over at Fangraphs, Rotographs, Sportsline, Rotoboiler, and I've got the Beat the Shift podcast. And I'm at ATCNY is my Twitter handle, and uh, I have separate feeds for the podcast and projections over there. All right. A word a little bit about projections before we talk about the volatility. Um, I am an actuary, and actuaries work in insurance. Um, You know, I do projections all the time. Uh, Here is something that I've done, you know, uh, on, on the right. These are potential losses modeled for next year you know projection is not just a point estimate it's not like oh a guy's gonna have six stolen bases for the year uh it's a probability distribution of all the possibilities of which the average is often what you see as the projection uh these are known as monte carlo simulations where i somehow simulate uh here a hundred thousand times of what could possibly be for the coming year and baseball projections are really Very similar in that regard in that it's a forecast about a player's true talent for the future. Uh, In every single baseball projection system, there is some elements of the following. Waiting of years, you took a take a look at historical experience. You regress to the mean if people had an outsized up or down performance. And you apply some aging curves and so on and so forth to get your projection system. And there's a ton of fantastic projection systems out there. Um, mine plus a bunch of others. Uh, there you go. So, uh, before we talk about the volatility, a little bit uh, of uh, backtrack on what exactly ATC does. ATC is not a standalone projection system, I'm not directly calculating anything. It's a wisdom of the crowds method. Uh, to get a really good answer, you ask a lot of different people, a lot of smart people. And just a lot of people in general. And somehow by polling everybody and knowing who the better guys are gives you a better answer to the question than any one single person. I often think of it uh, as uh, hurricanes. Uh, I do a lot of modeling of hurricanes at my job right now. And you've all seen these uh, cones of probability of going up where we think the hurricane's probably going to go. Well, actually, it comes from a, a lot of different models. You've all seen the hurricane spaghetti models where there's maybe 10, 15 different models that are projected. And when you take a center line and you take an ag- average of them and you blend them a certain way, the, uh, the center line track is the best answer of most likely uh, track to come. The 
the uh, the betting average, if you will, uh, what you should bet on if you had a hundred hurricanes that you're going to bet on, where will it go over the years? That betting line is good, and that comes from the aggregation of a lot of different tracks. So we use all different models. Different models are different are good in certain ways. Some are good for temperature. Some are good for wind speed. But that blending of it does the job there. The ATC projections. No, our, uh, the name of it is the average total cost projections, and that's because we average many other baseball projection systems. Um, it's a projections aggregator. Uh, what ATC does is it takes the best parts of each projection system. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about that in a bit here. Uh, and, of course, yes, ATC happens to be my initial, so it, that all works out nicely, obviously. <laughs> uh, but ATC is a smart average. Um, not all projection systems are created equally. A lot of people say, all right, let me aggregate projections, and they just say take all, all projections equal, you know, 20% of five projections. Um, I mean, some projections are better for a certain particular statistic, right? Some projections are terrible at a certain statistic. You can have a really good projection in general that's lousy at triples, right? It just could be, right? So why would you want to give it the same weight as any other statistic? You, you shouldn't, right? Um, and so it's a smart average is what ATC is. And uh, as I've uh, done in this present uh, in PitchCon before, uh, I use a blending model very similar to what Nate Silver does over at 538. And uh, for example, for him, if he's, let's say he has two poles and he's calculated that the optimal weights for the Florida model is 80% Quimpiac and 20% Rans Rasmussen, maybe for the Nevada model, it's 30-70. Well, that's very similar to what I'll do. Let's say I have two models, steamer and zips. I'll take 80% of one, 20% of the other for the homers. But stolen bases, it might be 30-70. Now, I have a lot of projections that underlie ATC, uh, so no one's going to get 80%, 70%, but just giving you the idea of uh, very generally how uh, I think about it. Uh, the most important thing about ATC is the studying part, is the experience part. I study how projections have performed in the past, over the past couple of years, and I've gathered if I had done a certain weighting of the ATC model per projection, it would have given me the best answer. Like if you would have used the ATC weights, the whatever ones I update and calculate it, that is the best answer over the past. Like You would have been great in the last couple of years. Um, it's a historical base model using other projections as uh, the feed. And of course, I do this for each and every statistic. There's a separate regression model for homers and for stri pitcher strikeouts, for uh, hit by pitches, you name it. All the, all the stats that I project are done the same way, including playing time. Um, I've done you know studies to show which projection systems are better in playing time, and that's how it's generated. It's an average of a bunch of different sources. Okay, but the, the main part of our presentation today is going to be about risk. And before I get into some of the ATC volatility metrics, I just want to explain the difference between what's called process risk and parameter risk. Two terms, process risk, parameter risk. Okay, so uh, let's say there's a projection system out there, a uh, new projection system called the Player Outlook Level Learning Articulation Calculation Kit Projections or the Pollock projections. I know you got PLV, Nick, but uh, uh, hey, maybe you didn't even know that you were doing this, the Pollock projections over here. This All is right. the most touching thing you've ever done for me. <laughs> I, do, I just want you to know that. I cannot believe that you've created the Pollock projections. <laughs> Thank you, Ariel, so oh. much. <laughs> Oh, more than more than welcome, Nick. So uh, thanks for the pop in. Uh, but yes, yeah, so Nick, you've created this projection system. I hope you I hope you like the acronym there. Uh, but let's say you put together a, a projection for Pete Alonso. Uh, what you don't do is you don't just say, yep, 40. Uh, if you're a big projection engine, you're actually going to evaluate all different kinds of scenarios that is within the range of Pete Alonso. So for example, in simulation 10, where there's 49 homers here, maybe you've projected that Alonso will win the home run title, 49 homers. In this simulation number eight, he's missed two months with a broken hand and he's only gotten 25 homers. Simulation five, he just simply underperformed, right? And 35 homers. Simulation 12, wow, he went on a great four game home run streak and he had 44 homers so on and so forth. 
you have all the different types of scenarios of what possibly can happen. Uh, injury, good performance, other teammates uh, are, are doing well, so that gives them more RBIs, right? It's all baked into your simulation, um, you know, so and so forth. Again, it's a, he's a million simulations representing the range of possibilities with probability, right? There's a probability of each event happening for what Pete Alonso can accomplish in 2023. It's a next year projection. And this is as p- predicted by Pollock simulations. Um, it's important to note that it's for 2023. Like people say, what do you mean a million years? 2023, 2024, 2025. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's like if he's done a million scenarios, uh, like, like I've done here for insurance, going back to this, I've, pr- I've, uh, I, in the simulations, I, I, I'm I'm uh, modeling fires and hurricanes and earthquakes and theft and alien invasion. Believe it or not, it's not in this one, but believe it or not, I've actually in the past had to model alien invasion. I had some client that was just wondering our exposure to stuff. I've actually also modeled meteorites falling and damaging uh, and damaging property. You, you name it, 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 you can come up with a model for anything. But the point is that uh, um, these are all the possibilities that can happen. And uh, what what is uh, what comes out of it is that uh, the true talent, the average, the level of of talent of Pete Alonso is forty point two homers. That that number you get at the end that most people look at a projection. That's just an average of the simulations. Okay. So process risk okay the first type of risk we're going to talk about process risk is the term i'll say this slowly for the inherent variance due to sample size so i say 2023 if a player would hypothetically play an infinite number of games then the average number of homers over any 162 game span if if the true talent is a certain number is going to be that. That 40.2 number that Pollock projected, that is the long-term average as if he was able to play a million different versions, hypothetical multiverses and all that. But there's going to be variation, right? Because uh, because any random thing can happen in a 162-game schedule, there's going to be variation. He'll get hurt. He'll do this, right? So the actual number that you end up with is not exactly the true talent the true talent is a reflection of the of the parameter of of his true of of what you would simulate off of but the actual result is different you know when i'm doing insurance i we have good years and we have bad years hurricanes can happen in good years and bad years you just don't know parameter risk uh is is ask the question wait a minute nick said that it's 40.2 how the heck do we know that that's that's actually right? Right? What if what if the Pollock projections were wrong? Right? Here's some other projections, for example. And the, by the way, these are not actual home run totals. I just put up these numbers, but the bat says 41.1. Spore and Mason have a new projection system. They say 42.2. You know, what what if, what if those other projections were right? How do we know that Nix is, is correct? Well, we don't know that it's correct, right? There's some risk about the true talent level being correct. That is what parameter risk is, okay? The, this, the, the term for it, the definition is the uncertainty of the true expectation. It's called parameter risk. Back to hurricanes as, you know, this is what my mind is on, so I always think about this. But uh, just to give you a little bit more of a feel of what parameter risk is and how the, the true expectation matters, um, you know, if you ever want to see uh, uh, an example of, you know, let's say hurricanes here in terms of number of hurricanes for a year. I don't have the numbers on here, but uh, here is the last, I don't know, 30 years. And here are the number of hurricanes that that happened within a year. And you can see there's some years where there is two hurricanes and some years where there is like 20 hurricanes. Right. It's different. If you were just to say, what's the true talent of this? What is the expectation? You would basically add up all the hurricanes, divide by the number of years, and that's your expected number of hurricanes for a year. Okay, that could be true, but we have different different possibilities in terms of um, underlying parameters. There are years of La Nina 
there are years of El Nino. La Nina is when there's uh, um, some uh, cooling, uh, cooling of the Pacific Ocean, and that somehow doesn't suppress hurricanes. And El Nino is when the waters warm in the Pacific, and somehow the Atlantic hurricanes uh, are, are stopped. There's fewer. And uh, if you take a look at, you know, how many hurricanes happen. There, here's El Nino. Here's uh, all the hurricanes over the last 30 years, right? There's some expectation. Maybe there's about three hurricanes a year, two, two hurricanes, three hurricanes, something like that. In a La Nino year, La Nina, La Nina year, there's a tremendous amount more. The expectation is about triple. It's about nine home runs, uh, no home runs, <laughs> nine hurricanes a year that are expected. The parameter of having El Nino being the true talent level is far different than the parameter of La Nina, right? You just have to know what year you're in, but you can see that it's almost like a bifurcated distribution. If I'm modeling hurricanes, you know, this true expectation could be right. This true expectation could be right. It's a different parameter. And of course, in a La Nina year, you don't get the same exact number of hurricanes. Sometimes there's 15 hurricanes, sometimes there's seven hurricanes. But the parameter that you're building off of is, let's say, a nine expectation, whereas El Nino, it's going to be lower, right? Let's give you a little bit of a flavor of it. But back to uh, back to uh, more of the baseball stuff. Um, and you think about it in uh, in terms of uh, reducing reducing risk and, and not, you know, process risk, the, the, the uh, risk of actually – uh, obtaining a certain amount uh, a, a specific number that cannot be materially minimized right it, 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 in the stock market we refer to it as market risk uh there's something that happens in the market covid happened uh the war in ukraine happened uh you know things happen that affect things globally that you just you just can't ever plan for if stocks go down you just can't plan for it right but if you diversify in the stock market if you diversify and you have a lot of different stocks, then your parameter risk is reduced. You have the chance to have it reduced because uh, no one stock can really be the driver if you have a very diverse panel and you have a lot of stocks. More and diverse usually lead to minimizing of parameter risk. And that's definitely something that uh, ATC takes part of. Let me just uh, go here. If by combining many sets of expectations, ATC reduces the risk of relying on any one single projection system. ATC reduces parameter risk, right? Because the uncertainty level goes down. There is no risk of where is the where it, where is the true talent. Um, the wisdom of the crowds method really is the way to go to minimize parameter risk. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about quantifying the risk, right? It's not just that you have risk, but let's come up with a way of actually quantifying what kind of risk uh, you have, all right? And for this parameter risk, just to note, you know, when I'm looking at projections for certain players, there are certain player projections where uh, all the different projections give a whole different value. Uh, some are all over the place. Sometimes stolen bases just all over the place. Playing time, who the heck knows, right? They're, we don't know. They're all over the place. Every single projection has a different thing. But sometimes you get projections that are largely in agreement with one on with one another, uh, where, oh, wow, this guy, 38 homers, 36 homers, 37 homers, 38 homers. That's not a lot of uncertainty between the projections. They're all pretty sure what the what the underlying risk is, or there, I should say they're more sure, right? Where there's more divergence, there's less agreement. There's less certainty of what the parameter is. And when they all agree, there is more certainty of what the parameters are. So to quantify this in terms of the baseball sense, what we do is we measure the range of the different projections and we measure the clustering or the symmetry of the different projections. You sort of see where it's situated. ATC is the average, and there's going to be some projections up and down. Are they more up? Are they more down? Are they far apart? Are they not far apart? And so on and so forth. Okay. Well, let's go to the next slide. Oops, just lost that. Here we go. 
Ah, yes. Some math. We knew that there was going to be uh, going to be some math here involved. Standard deviation. All right. I don't want to get so bogged down into the mathematics of everything, but I think everyone should just have a very, everyone should already have a good understanding if you're watching his podcast, if you're watching the uh, the conference, I should say, uh, of what standard deviation is. Standard deviation is the spread, is how far apart uh, things are. The mathematical sense, uh, there's the formula, it's the square root of blah, blah, blah squared. I mean, you don't really have to remember that or know anything about it. Um, just to, I put in there that standard deviation is a second order statistic. Um, you know, the expectation of mean, you know, is just you're dealing with X here. You're dealing with X squared. Uh, it's just a little bit of a, of a nuance here. Um, not that it matters, but, uh, it's, it's happy for actuaries to, uh, talk about orders of statistics. All right. Anyways, uh, the, uh, ATC projections has a statistic that we've come up with here. And it's called the Interprojection Standard Deviation, InterSD. Um, I probably should have thought about renaming these more fun terms, but for the moment, I uh, I just thought of well, it's Interprojection between projections, standard deviation, SD. So it's the in between projection standard deviation, uh, and that's literally what it is. It will describe how much projections disagree about a player. The larger the interest D, the more they differ. The smaller the interest D, the more projections are the same. And in general, and I'll show you some historical math as to why I think that's true. In general, you're better off having projections that agree. When you're more sure of the result, you're more sure of what the statistic is. I love finding players that projections agree on and are bargains where, let's say, ATC says it's a $20 player. The market says it's a $15 player. And projections agree. So smart projections agree. The average of the smart projections agree. There's not a lot of variance. And it's better than the market. Oh, my goodness. It's a bargain, right? Where you have projections differ. Yeah, who knows? Maybe maybe a, one of the lower projections is right. Maybe the super high one is right. Tougher to tell. But when you have things that are more similar, it's generally better. There's less risk, right? There's less parameter risk. So it's a measure of parameter risk. Skewness. Now, I people have seen standard deviation, but not that many people have heard of skewness, okay? Uh, well, I'll just show you what it is. It, it, roughly, here's the math. It's dealing with powers of three. It's a third order statistic. I'm not going to deal with the fourth order one. The fourth order statistic here is actually called kurtosis. The heck with kurtosis for now. We're just going to deal with skewness. But skewness is a measure of how distorted the symmetry is. Okay, so uh, I'll 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 describe this a little bit more in a second. But uh, again, the definition of interprojection skewness, inter sk. So we have inter sd, inter sk, interprojection skewness is uh, is the skewness of the underlying projections around the ATC average. I'm actually taking a, 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 you know, some statistical formulas about the distribution. Describes the symmetry of the line, underlying projections. Okay. Uh, so here's, I'll go through a minute uh, 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 here on, on what it looks like. When you have in the top one on the right, the zero skewness one, that's a spot where there is no, um, the, it's perfectly symmetrical. Projections are just as up and just just as down. Now, it does not tell you anything about how spread it is. You can have a lot of projections that are the same. You can have, you know, five, six, five, six, five, six, five, six, and that's a very tight and it's symmetric. Or I can have a distribution of data that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's perfectly symmetric, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's a bunch of numbers to the left of five, a bunch of numbers to the right of five equally, right? So skewness just tells you about how they're situated doesn't tell you about the distribution. When I had 5656, five, six, that's a small standard deviation. The 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 is a large standard deviation with the same zero skew. The negative skew means that there are more, even though it says negative, it means that there's more on the upside 
of a player, there's more meat to this distribution. More of the projections, the mean, median, and the mean and median are above the mean. The reason why it's called negative is because there is a, a negative outlier. There is a projection that's farther down, that's outside, that's pulling the average to the left. So if you had nine, 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 one, well, the average is not going to be nine. The average is going to be like eight something. That one, that outlier, pulls it down. So it's negatively skewed. And positive is the opposite. Most of the fat of the distribution is to the left. And then the uh, there's a, an outlier to the right higher. There's a positive outlier is positive skew. Negative outlier means negative skew. And I will show you in a bit, but negative skews are better. Positive skews are worse because the wisdom of the crowds is closer to the median, right? Mean is the betting average, right? You want to bet on the long run, but the meat of the distribution is is closer, to, is going to be to the right. And when you have a negative outlier, that outlier is not that close to the to the wisdom of the crowds. I'm saying that the wisdom of the crowds should be trusted more. So the expected return could be slightly up. So if you want to find a player with some upside, look at negatively skewed distributions of ATC players. Last year, for example, Aaron Judge was the most negatively distributed player. There was ATC gave an average, and there was a couple of two outliers that were way, way lower than they should be. And that just signals that, hold on, the wisdom of the crowd is higher. His expected numbers were actually higher than that. Now, Aaron Judge took off, so, you know, it makes this example work. I picked the best example, but just happened to be that a very negatively skewed player did really well. All right, and it has been historically true. I'll show you some research to, to suggest that. Uh, one thing to note that when I'm showing and I list inter SD, inter SK, um, I'm calculating it off of total player values. Um, I'm not using it off of homers. Like, I'm not saying here's the inter SD for homers, here's the inter SK for stolen bases. I'm doing it off of total aggregated value, and I use 15 team five by five standard format and you know goes deep um but technically it can be calculated for any statistic you can have an interest for homers and for strikeouts and for whatnot and it also makes sense in any specific format like you can do it for points leagues you can do it for um uh, you know al only leagues or whatever whatever you want to do 12 team 15 18 team league uh, the, the statistic makes sense in any different context as well the combination of the two give you that picture of what the distribution looks like. It provides color as to a player's risk. So just to get everyone set with the math, I'll just show you a couple of examples. Here's a bunch of players. I don't know if they actually play in the major leagues or not. Uh, and here's a bunch of projection system, including uh, Pollock's projections, uh, for what they say. Here's the color involved. So, for example, for Alex Fast, this projection, there's a zero interest K. That means that the projections are distributed. ATC average on the right here, if you see my mouse, 44. And then you have a couple low, a couple high, right? The 46, 41. So it's, you know, distributed somewhat. It's not that far away. They're all in the 40s. So it's fairly low interest D, but they're absolutely totally symmetric. Scott Chu, on the other hand, well, let's talk about his interest K. It's negative, negative almost two. That's because the Zips projection for him is 28. All the other projections are in the high 30s. That outlier makes, even though most projections are 36, 30, you can see 36, 38, right? But the ATC average is 35. That's because it's being pulled down by Zips. Maybe Zips is wrong. Zips is not part of the wisdom of the crowds. It's far away from the wisdom of the crowds. So Galena? Let's call attention to his very, very widely distributed uh, five interest, which is high. And you can see there are projections for him as $23 players. There's projections for him as $36 players. Pretty evenly distributed as the interest K is almost zero, but it's all over the place. Adam Howe, very low, very low interest. D, and you can see that all the numbers are within just a couple of 
like tens of cents within each other. Tens of dollars. Uh, sorry, uh, dimes. A bunch of <laughs> a bunch of cents. Uh, tens of cents. Uh, Kevin Hastings, Inter SK high. That's because there is this outlier projection by Spore Mason of 19. All the others are 15, 16. But because of that 19, that ATC average was pulled to 17. And that hopefully gives you a little bit of mathematical understanding of what these numbers actually mean. Um, because ATC is a little bit black box, you actually don't get the actual details of the different projections because you don't know how much of each are being used. All you have on the right are the you have what ATC says and you have the interest, the interest. Okay, but, but when you have that, you can get a picture in your mind of what's going on in terms of, oh, okay, Alex Fast has zero. All right, people are they're equally distributed. Kevin Hastings, whoa, that dude has has a uh, an outlier that 16.9 ATC average. Maybe it shouldn't be, maybe because it's the it's high, maybe. The, the meat of the crowd is left. Maybe we should actually take off a little bit. So it gives you a little bit of a flavor. Okay. One other risk I want to talk about is profile risk. Interprojection volatility serves to quantify the parameter risk of projections, but here we're talking about the categorical or profile risk. What I'm talking about is uh, dimension of uh, a player. One statistical category, how much weight anyone has. Think of the rotisserie sense is the best way. Um, if you have a, let's take Adalberto Mondesi, the easiest example. Adalberto Mondesi, all of his value is concentrated in steals. If he fails to steal, there is the risk that his value will go to zero. If you're doing a fantasy team and Adalberto Mondesi gets hurt on your roster, what happens to your steals if you are expecting 40 steals from him? Oh boy. It's an outsized impact, and that's because he had an outsized profile risk. His profile was too weighted in one specific area, whereas if you take a guy like, say, a Suzuki, that his his value is distributed all over the place, sure, you lose the player, but you don't get an outsized impact in any category because his profile is distributed. Intra-projectional standard deviation, so intra SD, intra is between itself, SD, standard deviation. Uh, I look at a uh, uh, player's categorical Z scores. So I'm looking at homers and RBIs and runs uh, for on a five by five cents for Roto. Uh, and I take the standard deviation. That will give me a measure of the dimension of a player's statistical profile. If somebody is, quote, one dimensional, that means they're only good at one thing. You can have a one dimensional player at anything like Luis Arias is a one-dimensional player. Right? It's just batting average. You know, it doesn't have to be a speedster. It's just one-dimensional. Uh, how about Edwin Diaz? Edwin Diaz is a one-dimensional player. Right? Most closers are. Now, Edwin Diaz does get a lot of strikeouts, but the bulk of his value is concentrated in saves. If you have Edwin Diaz on your team and he goes down, oh boy, what does that do to the saves on your team, that category balance? Ooh, it crushes it, right? It's even worse for him because he, he gets so many of the saves for your team, right? Now, should you not buy closers? Should you not buy one-dimensional players? No, but just know that these players are riskier to your roster, right? You, it's almost better now, if Diaz is going to have 40 saves. It's almost better to get a 20 and a 20. You have less risk of going to zero, right? Now, of course, there might be market pricing. Uh, uh, you know, something could be priced more or not. But in terms of pure risk to your roster from that one category, um, it's very high. There's Mondesi. Speedsters will have a high one. How about these guys? How about uh, uh, Bichette? How about Kyle Tucker? Those are what we would call five-category players. They have a very low intra-SD. Now, those are really good players, so obviously you're going to be hurt if the player is out. But again... It's not compounding one specific category. It's not taking your category balance. Again, it's not the risk of your team value. It's the risk of your team spread of value. Okay? That's what it is. It's dimension here. All right. Before we go into specifically the volatility charts, just to talk about a little bit of the research that on effect of uh, the research as to uh, why low risk is better. Um, and I 
did a little study here on how do, do these risk characteristics affect your actual rotisserie earnings. What can we learn from the ATC volatility metrics from these quantities on how actually you perform? So here's what I did. And I did this empirically, meaning I went back in history and I compiled data. I took the last 44 years of data. I removed 2020 because um, it, 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 the data just doesn't make as much sense. Short season values are going to be very, very differently spread. It's just not a good, not a good comparison. Uh, I split data by hitter versus pitcher. I grouped data into different preseason ATC projected values. I took high value hitters, middle value hitters, low value hitters. I also grouped data by risk range. So I took low risk, medium risk, high risk, and so on and so forth. And I, the calculation, the comparison I did is I said, okay, what did ATC project them as before? What did it, it, it turn out in the end, right? And if you take any one player, it's not going to tell you anything. Oh, I, I mean, I told you Aaron Judge. Wow. I guess the ATC stat works. Look what it did with Aaron Judge. Okay, that's one player. Maybe it failed for two of them. Did it? I don't know. This is what the comparison is. Let's see what a batch of data. Uh, I can't remember exactly how many data points, but it's something like something like 90 data points in in most of these range risk ranges. And it's, I guess, uh, Maybe maybe a thousand players in you know split into the different ranges. Maybe two hundred and fifty players per per uh, value range. So a nice chunk of data where you know an average is already uh, significant. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with the technical math here, but uh, the idea is look at the trend line for some of these. For interest D, you can see the trend line goes down in general. Um, if you have uh, on the left. Uh, so the way the way we read it is top to bottom is rotisserie earnings. Um, it's it's actual rotisserie earnings. And to the right, going to left to right is a uh, risk range. The lower risk players are to the left. The higher risk players are to the right. Within each color, it's the same dollar group. Right. So I took all twenty dollar players, all ten dollar play, uh, mid teens dollar players, all low dollar players. They represent the group here. And then you can see what the earnings are when we split them by range. So by and large, if you start at the top left, that's low risk, high uh, low risk, you're earning a lot. But because the trend line's down, it means that with increased risk, you're actually lowering the expected value. That tells me that what I said is true. Lower the higher the risk, the lower you'll actually expect. And it's somewhat significant here, right? You can see the, the trend. And it's uh, pretty much at every single price point. Maybe the little bit of the uh, middle is a little bit more flatter uh, as, you know, maybe low hitters give you a little bit more upside. But in general, the trend is pretty uh, direct here. For pitchers, uh, it's about true on top. It's not really true at the bottom. You almost want more risk at the bottom for risky pitchers. This is nice because it tells you where you want risk. Oh, in the middle and sort of up top, you, you do want not you don't want to take that much risk oh on the bottom you do want to take more risk yeah i sort of believe it and that's what this tells you skew all negative here pretty much right negative trend again if if the more the more negative the skew the higher the expected value as you go to the right the higher the the positive and positively high skews the less expected value um and the same is true for pitchers especially up top Interest is not as determinant. I'll talk about that in a minute why it's a little bit inconclusive. Not really getting some, some good results. They're closer to flat. Pitchers are really all over the place. You can see some trend lines, but the points are just completely wild. At the top, it looks like it's zooming up. The bottoms are all down. It's pretty inconclusive there. I'll talk about it in a second, but uh, just to show you the takeaways from the graphs, I don't want to bulge on the math, but uh, again, yes, higher parameter risk is a lower expectation. This is globally true for hitters. It's true for most pitchers with the following exceptions. The, your FP1s, I found no correlation. So if pr projections disagree at the very, very top, doesn't really say anything about the pitcher. But for the bulk of your rotation, it will be. But at the bottom, you almost want more. When ATC projects something around zero to five dollars, actually, where you have some kind of difference in projections, you can actually find some upside. So that is true there. 
total effect, if you're going to actually take a global trend line for everything, pitchers and hitters included, it's about, minus, it's about 25 cents decline for every dollar of inter-SD. Inter-SK take, takeaways, uh, wisdom of the crowds should be trusted over outlier projections. If you find an outlier, I'm not going to say toss it because it's important in ATC average, but uh, it, it's less important, let's call it. Um, Inter-SK is a stronger predictor for hitter than pitchers. That is true. The total effect is about 75 cents per dollar of Inter-SK. Now, it looks like it's triple the 25 cent value I mentioned, but uh, it's not really because well, it is a little bit, but not triple. The range of Inter-SD is far greater. So Inter-SD goes from like around $2 worth of Inter-SD all the way up to $10 of Inter-SD. But this range is like from negative two and a half to positive two and a half. So it's a smaller range uh, going more in uh, getting a dollar worth of, of symmetry is a lot stronger than a dollar worth of volatility just because of this scales. Uh, I said that it's inconclusive for the intra SD uh, in total, a lower intra in, in total. It's true. Uh, yes. Um, and it's about 25 cents per dollar of intra SD. Uh, but the regression yields low significance. Like when you do the regression, you get your R squared. It, it's lower. I, I'm less sure that this is true. Uh, the other reason why I'm less sure this is true is because I actually see reversals between different seasons. So for the other statistics, whatever was negative one year, oh, my God, if I split it by year, it's actually negative again and again. It's negative in 2019, negative in 2021. But for intra-SD, it's, it's, it, it could be flipped. So it's hard to pick a trend line when you actually see differences between the slope being positive and negative. Um, this could be the result of a rapidly changing baseball environment. I don't know. 2021 projections were wonky because of a short season. So I don't want to give a conclusion yet. Let's just wait on it. Uh, it's also, in general, the definition is more useful for hitters than pitchers. I mean, again, anybody who's high in SD for pitchers are all closers. I probably should have split this analysis, pitchers, starters versus relievers, but you know, just the way I did it, it's not as useful. And uh, notice that there's no five category pitchers, right? There are no pitchers who are good in wins and saves and strike, right? It, you can't get a good in everything uh, just by the definition. So it's less meaningful uh, as a statistic when compared to the same one. It's still, you can calculate it the same way, but it's different uh, for hitters. Have I lost anybody here? <laughs> a lot of math here. I'll get to the fun stuff in just a second. Uh, just a couple of assorted notes. Intra-SD is not unique to ATC, meaning you can do this statistic on steamer projections, on zip projections, just whatever they say the category is. Um, I thought about doing combos of, oh, what if you have a high interest SD, low interest K? What if you have a high and high? Uh, but we don't have enough data yet to really analyze the combo of ranges. I need to wait a couple more years to actually see something meaningful. So hold off on that. Um, and to date, the only study I've done here are what are the average expected effects, like a linear trend line. But what I usually study, and I probably should study this, is how about the hit rates? Does it, you know, does a lower prob does a lower risk give you a higher hit rate on the player? Meaning, meaning you're right compared to market. Is it lower? You know, just are you wrong compared to market? Just what percentage of time you write hits and busts? That's a good study. I should probably do that next. Um, but yeah, ATC, they are predictive though, uh, and you should pay attention to them. All right. Before we do some of the charts, just to show you what you might do in terms of risk adjusted pricing, meaning if you would say, all right, a player is worth $20, but now let's include in the price elements of risk. Uh, here's what you would get using those overall trend lines that I gave you. The adjustment you would make, it's not huge, and it's not huge because I'm doing this in a global sense. If you really want to do a good risk-adjusting price, you'd split it by price range, by player. You might have some health risks doing a little bit different things, but just to show you what theoretically a global, what you can easily do if you did the math, uh, the adjustment that you would make from interest D is anywhere from plus and minus about a dollar and a third to a, a, a 15 team auction price. Interest K, it's a little bit more widespread. The outliers are more meaningful. And intra SD, uh, very, very small. Again, we showed it's not consistent and um, it wasn't a big, wasn't a big trend line anyway. So uh, total adjust, adjustment risk for a player. Anybody can pick up pretty much plus or minus $3. So a $10 player could be seven with negative risk adjustments or $13 with the positive risk adjustments.
And here's a couple of players that, you know, you might find. Evan Phillips would lose about $3. Logan Webb, Ross Stripling, look at those San Francisco pitchers. Hmm. They, maybe they could be risky. Maybe projections are doing something with them. Maybe take off $2 in, on your price. Garrett Mitchell, projections are all over the place on his stolen bases. Because of that, he gets docked. How about Tyler Anderson, Tony Gonsolin? Those are pitchers who had really good years last year. Maybe there's some projections that take history more. And so uh, maybe uh, because of that, the projections are spread more, you know, things like that. How about some positive adjustments? These are the more interesting ones. George Kirby. Look at that. You got Logan Gilbert down in there as well. Hmm. That, that's interesting to hear young pitchers. Adley Rutschman. Wow. You usually don't see young rookie catchers as, oh, wow. He gets a positive risk adjustment. But he does. Um, you got Jeremy Pena in there. Alec Bohm. Um, I really love Alec Bohm for this year. And he gets a risk adjustment. Positive. So whatever ATC is projecting actually should be higher if you consider his risk characteristics. So I kind of like that. I use these as a guide to say, hmm, you know, boil down. And if you don't want to do a big mathematical add this risk, pro you know, you don't have to. But you can use the information. That's what the ATC volatility charts are for. Um, it's a visual depiction. We start with a visual depiction of the player pool arranged in the order of the NFBC ADP. So I'm going to show you a chart. All it is is showing the chart of how the snake drafts are going, just so you can see players visually with them. Uh, you'll see what I mean in a minute. The coloring on each page on the interest D charts, green are good, low values, red are high for interest K. Green is negative or good. Red is positive or bad. And then I use the meth colors, blue and orange, for low and for high. Blue is low. Orange is high. Let's take a look at what we see in them. Uh, here is, just to set it up, these are the NFBC ADP charts. Trey Turner is the overall number one pick over the last month. Jose Ramirez, number two, blah, 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 blah. It's colored right here by the position. Right? It doesn't say anything. Rounds 11 to 20, and so on and so forth. All right. But we're going to talk a little bit here about what we see in the risk charts, interest T. So these are red is wide dispersion. Green is low dispersion between projections. Bo Bichette, Jordan Alvarez, Mookie Betts. Projections agree. Shohei Otani, the hitter, not so much. Look at Jacob DeGrum staring you in the face about in the second round. Projections do not agree. Hmm. Well, I... I think that people can understand that with him, right? It's not hard. Fernando Tatis, mm, what's he going to do? Sort of intuitive, right? Uh, those two, at least, are intuitive. How about Julio Urias in the fourth round? People think, wait a minute, Julio Urias? What the hell? He's been awesome. Well, Julio Urias has outperformed his FIP and ex-FIP for the past couple of years. Every single year, projections have him to increase Increase because, oh, he's been lucky, or at least according to the, the you know, some of the uh, ERA estimators who've been lucky. But there are some projections that probably disregard it that say, hmm, Julio Urias, no, nope, he's going to do exactly what he did. So because of that, you get this high dispersion. Now, will Julio Urias really continue? Will he outperform his luck? Who knows? But this a, a little bit of caution in that. Not everybody is in agreement. Max Fried, same thing also. He's been lucky. Trevor Story, bright red. Uh, that's because what is his playing time? Who knows what it is? Uh, and you can see it pops up here. Randy Rosarina looks pretty solid in terms of what projections say. Framber Valdez looks good. Kyle Wright, nice and green. Even Christian Yelich. Uh, Jake McCarthy, look at that. That's interesting. Uh, let's take a little, a little bit deeper. Tony Gonsolin, bright red. We knew that. We saw that before. Ezekiel Tovar in the 17th round, bright red. Aha. Well, what's he going to do? How many plate appearances will he going to get? A lot of rookies are usually red. Look at Jordan Walker. What is Jordan Walker going to do? How much will he play? Who the heck knows? We talked about Anderson and Mitchell. In the green here, you got Ryan Mountcastle. Look how bright green he is. Paul Seawold. He was on the pitch con yesterday. Hmm. He looks pretty safe here. All right. So, again, this is not the be-all, end-all, but this – shows you very colorfully where projections agree and disagree. Inter SK, let's see what we see. Yeah, Logan Webb, there's where he came up. Apparently, with the red in the round eight, Logan Webb has some outlier projection high. Maybe, you know, maybe he's also outperformed some of his metrics. 
maybe being in a pitcher park, maybe that happens, right? In San Francisco and Dodger State, maybe, that, maybe that's why it happens. Um, but it's a caution that, well, the ATC says it's this, but there's that outlier above. Maybe caution that he could be a little bit lower. Who's green there? There's uh, Adley Rutschman, George Kirby. We've seen these guys bubble to the top, and this gives you the whole range of the gamut. Right, look, at, look at the top row. You got Bo Bichette. Now, not terribly red, but it's tilted towards – it's positive, right? But we saw in the other round that he was projections agreed. So what does that mean? That means that projections agree. If any, he's got a little bit of a tilt towards the downside. Okay. So let's continue and talk a little bit about intra SD. Um, all right, well, there you go. First round, blue, Kyle Tucker, Bo Bichette. And Fernando Tatis is blue. I mean, his he's spread. He's got a lot of uh stolen bases, homers, he does you everything. The you might want to look at the blue. You'll see all the closers in orange. Again, it doesn't really tell you not to take them. The closers are gonna be that. That's that's what it is. More of a hitter statistic. Uh looks like John Birdie pops up bright orange. Luis Arias in the 15th round, orange. Um, that's because he's one-dimensional batting average. At Alberto Mondesi pops up there. Uh, let's look at uh, yeah Jonathan India in the 13th round. Ian Haps in the uh, 11th round. Those are guys that, hey, if you want to just get value, value, and have it spread, those are good guys. So uh, there you go. All right, to wrap up, and then we'll take some questions with a couple minutes remaining. Use ATC projections to evaluate players and minimize parameter risk. The ATC metrics, risk-adjusted pricing, um, and to manage aggregate risk. And the volatility charts can map your draft by highlighting players with a high or low level of risk. Wow, that was a lot of material uh, about the ATC projections and volatility. And uh, maybe we'll take a couple of couple of questions, Nick, if, uh, if you want to pop in and uh, see what we can get. Hey, guys. Uh, very quickly, for some reason, StreamYard was just like, hey, let's just kind of mess things up for a second. Yeah. Uh, booted me out too, booted you out and oh. everything. So I wasn't guys, me, it wasn't me then. Stream. Wasn't your fault okay. whatsoever. Okay. Uh, okay, good. But just a heads up about that. That's what was going on. Great. Uh, awesome stuff. So, Ariel, I, I really do want to highlight again. I, I think this is the um, the most important part here. Based on this risk stuff, uh, I remember one of the conversations I had with you in uh, Arizona was a lot about, hey, these guys are more risky than others, um, and we should avoid them while these guys are not. And I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, the best, the, be the guys that we kind of innately were raising because of their lower risk on the pitching side was like Max Freed, for example. And um, that you wanted to lower, you make the case about Shohei Otani. Uh, being having doubled the chance of getting hurt, right? So I know that wasn't really that part wasn't really assessed inside of the volatility stuff we're talking about, but I did want to really ask like from this stuff, what are the biggest points you're taking away and adjusting uh, for 2023? Yeah, um, so you know I do I do general risk adjustments when I price. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know I, I I have it baked in in a formula just as that a dollar two dollars there. Uh, it just gives the edge, right? I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go in the draft and say, "Oh my God, Max Reed, he's highlighted in red. Stay away from." It's not a stay away from statistic. Sure, it's just knowing that you have extra risk, and you can do it in one of two ways. You can either number one, take off a dollar or two on his price, or take off a mm -hmm. round on his price, uh, and say, "Okay, maybe some of the other more comparable guys, I'll, I'll push up," or you can use it to assess your team's total risk. So if you take Max Freed, maybe take another pitcher who's around there who's got a low risk, right? You wouldn't want to take Freed and um, and Webb because they both have very high risk characteristics. Maybe pair them off. So mm. it's a way to manage risk on your total aggregate team um, that way. Sure. Uh, it makes me wonder um, if there's a way to um, to essentially say, like, all right, let's add up all of the risk yeah. Um, and then just say you have to stay underneath this total number of risk when drafting a team. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's one way you can do. You can set risk targets. You can set inter yeah. SD risk targets, um, or you can at least say to take on X risk, I need X profit. So you can see, all right, if 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 I, you know, if I'm gonna pay, uh, you know, if you. It's okay to, to get a higher risk if you're going to pay more under. So maybe you can take a look at your uh, 
profit, expected profit per dollars of risk and make sure mm -hmm. it stays above a certain right. number. Awesome. Um, by the way, yeah, everybody, we have a few more minutes. If you uh, have a question you want to ask Ariel, um, please, uh, please leave it in. I know that, Ariel, you're generally, look, I have my projection system, my dollar values, and I stick to that. But in your gut, who is the guy that you will maybe want to spend an extra dollar or two on this year? Um, well, I, 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 you, you saw Alec Bohm there. Um, yeah. you know, I, I, I never go for sexy guys up top and say, oh, wow, Juan Soto, man, mm -hmm. Julio Rodriguez. Like, I don't think you're going to win your draft anyways. I like the guy somewhere down there. Bohm, I like his risk statistics. I actually think, I mean, whatever he did last year, I think he can continue doing. Sure. And he's being priced nicely by the market. Good market price, good risk statistics. It's just nice confirmation. So he's one of the guys that I'm I'm looking at there. Haven't done my full assessment of everything, um, mm -hmm. and I'll I'll continue to do so as uh, the draft season goes on. Um, and we talk about all these guys on our podcast, the Beat the Shift podcast. But yeah, so for, for that, that's the one I have called attention to first. Nice. Uh, that sounds great because if you watched last night's mock draft that we held, you'll notice that there was a lot of discussion about after especially like in 12 teamers after Arenado goes and Riley and Machado Devers. The question becomes, what are you supposed to do with third base after that? And so I, I took the experiment thing. Look, I want to take Alex Bregman at the end of the fourth, because there's just nothing after that. And then understanding what the game plan is. If you don't have Bregman, is that the last one? Uh, we were, tr they may be thinking it's Matt Chapman. Maybe it's Max Muncy, but Alec Bohm coming in. Uh, maybe that should be something that I, I guess he's going around what in 12 teamers would be like the 13th, 14th round. I don't know what the dollar value that you have is. Yeah. Relative he'll be equivalent to, uh, he'll be equivalent to about an $8 player in round uh, yeah. 13. Okay. Yeah. So I, uh, so <laughs> the answer is Yandy and Justin Turner. I uh, robbed uh, Pietro. I don't know if I want to do that in my 12 teamers. Uh, so maybe it's Alec Bohm is the one that I, that I go for instead. I, I did see a good question. Um, from JT here, uh, are the risk numbers presented weighted? Um, for example, low versus high plate appearances or innings? Uh, weighted in terms of plate appearances. So um, they're not weighted. In, I guess you mean, are they weighted? So you give more credit to the ones that have more plate appearances. I imagine uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so they're not weighted by plate appearance. They're weighted mm -hmm. as a percentage of uh composition of the atc overall okay so the projections that get more weight in total and i have a way of calculating even though i do different projections for different statistics um the ones that have the more impact on your value mm -hmm. get more so um i sort of i didn't lie but i sort of did a very simple oversimplification of Take a, take an average of all the projections, and it's not like I add them up and divide by this. And <laughs> for for standard deviation, I add them up and divide. Uh, it's it's weighted, right? Gotcha. The, the more of the standard deviation, well, you know, you get more of. It's weighted, but it's weighted by uh, participation in the overall dollar for ATC. All right. Well, Ariel Cohen, thank you so much for once again another fantastic presentation here at PitchCon. Everybody, go follow him, ATC NY. Uh, and, uh, yeah, Errol, I guess I'll see you soon. You're going to be at Florida. Are you going to be there? I'll be there. I'll be in your, uh, labor draft. That's right. So first pitch Florida. I will be there with right. Ariel Cohen. I'm excited to see you in person then. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for being a part of PitchCon once again. Absolutely. And can't wait to hear the rest of it. Donate, right, donate thanks. guys. Everyone donate.